Hi, it's lovely to be here. Um, my name is Laura Edwards. I teach in the history department here at Princeton University. And my official title is kind of long. It is the class of 1921 bicentennial professor in the history of American law and liberty. And I'm excited to be talking with you about my new book, which is just coming out. So I wanna begin with six women and a sheet. All of them, the women and the sheet, appeared in New York City's municipal court in 1804. But actually it was a sheet that started it all. One of the women, Sarah Allingham, charged another woman, Judith Friel, with stealing the sheet, although the charges vastly oversimplified the situation. Judith Friel was a washerwoman who just happened to have the sheet among the dirty laundry she was collecting that day. So imagine her consternation where Sarah Allingham waylaid her in the street, grabbed up all her bundles, and began rummaging through them. When Allingham found what she insisted was her sheet, she announced her discovery, loudly, and marched off with it to file charges, Friel following in her wake. So once in court, it became clear that Friel was merely transporting the sheet. She had not actually stolen it. It was another woman, Sally Riley, who had taken it nearly a year earlier. Riley then had sold it to Rosanna Marrara, whose bundle of laundry was the one that contained the sheet. So both of those women joined the other two, making four women and a sheet in the court. Two more then appeared as witnesses to support Rosanna Marrara's claims that she had purchased the sheet from Sally Riley, bringing us to six women and a sheet. Ultimately, the court awarded the sheet to Rosanna Marrara. Case closed. But actually not so fast. Given conventional historical wisdom, this dispute never should have made it to court at all. These were poor women, mostly Irish women, actually squabbling over a very cheap sheet. And more to the point, they were married, encumbered by coverture, a collection of legal principles that limited wives' legal rights and subordinated them to their husbands. Among other things, coverture prohibited wives from owning property and prosecuting court cases in their own names. And more than that, coverture actually gave husbands legal rights to property their wives brought into marriage and anything they acquired afterward. So by those rules, Sarah Allingham could not own a sheet at all, let alone prosecute a case to claim ownership. Yet in Sarah Allingham's case, officials accepted both the women's claims to property ownership and their access to the legal system. They did give a nod to Coverture's rules, identifying the prosecutor as Allingham's husband, attributing the ownership of the sheet to him as well on the forms. But after filling in the obligatory boxes, officials dispensed with this fiction that the matter had anything to do with the husband's. For court officials, as well as the women involved, the question was which married woman possessed the sheet, not whether a married woman could possess it. To make things more interesting, this case was not unusual. Between the Revolution and the Civil War, courts in the United States regularly dealt with similar cases, cases involving claims by people on the legal margins, claims often by people without property rights at all, claims that they made to clothing and related accessories, such as hats and handkerchiefs, also uncut cloth and bed linens, like this sheet. So how could people without property rights claim property? That is the question that I explore in my new book, Only the Clothes on Her Back, Clothing and the Hidden History of Power in the 19th Century United States. The answers lie in the legal qualities attached to clothing. People without property rights, including married women and enslaved people, relied on long-standing legal principles that attach clothing to the person who wore it. But they did not stop there. Through use, these people expanded those principles to make legal claims to all kinds of textiles and accessories that they made or that simply passed through their hands. And then they went further still, using the security provided by law to turn these goods into currency, into capital, and into collateral, which gave them an entry point into governing institutions and the economy. People like Sarah Allingham were not on the outside looking in, as we usually assume. Instead, they used textiles to include themselves in governing institutions and the economy. They actually made law, insisting on the recognition of commonly held legal principles that, unlike property rights, apply broadly to everyone. The fuss over Sarah Allingham's sheet was not unusual. Once you start looking for textiles, you realize that textiles were everywhere. People made them, they sold them, they fought over them all the time. Yet scholars have tended to dismiss such property as merely consumer goods, not valuable, and focused instead on the kind of property, land, slaves, commodities, owned by the minority of the population, but assumed to have wide-reaching economic effects. 
Textiles, however, were hardly just consumer goods. They too were valuable property, valuable property that unlike other forms of property, most Americans could actually own in law. By the time of the revolution, the economics of textiles had hit a real sweet spot. What had once been luxury goods were now more affordable and more available, but not so cheap as to be completely worthless. Quality mattered and people really knew quality. A broad range of Americans, including the poor and enslaved, could spot fine linen, silk, and wool at 10 paces, and they could assess trimmings such as ribbon and braid just as accurately. That knowledge was on prominent display in theft cases across the United States. Parties to these cases would describe cloth and clothing in great detail, distinguishing cheap goods from expensive ones, and rattling off information about fiber content, colors, and patterns that most people today would never notice, let alone remember. Now, all those details about patterns and colors actually function just like figures on a banknote. And in fact, textiles were preferable to banknotes for most Americans. Possession of banknotes was suspect for poor people and people without property rights. The presumption was that they could not have them. Not so with the possession of textiles because of all the legal principles associated with them. Textiles also had economic advantages over banknotes because they held their value far more reliably. The material qualities of textiles also suited them for use as currency. There was considerable consensus as to their value. They were extremely liquid, and they came in different denominations, which ran the gamut from handkerchiefs, cheap, to expensive lengths of cloth. When people traded in these goods, they were not bartering. They valued items in pounds and later in dollars, and then bought and sold accordingly, or leveraged the value of textiles as people did with other kinds of property. They pawned them, they lent them, they saved them to fund other ventures. The result was this vast secondary market, which provided not just access to goods, but also the means to circulate them. This part of the market was everywhere and included pawnbrokers, auctioneers, peddlers, grocers, tavern keepers, tailors, dressmakers, and vendors in open air markets, as well as individuals who simply sold on the streets and from their homes. To say that this market was underground or informal misconstrues its institutional underpinnings, which depended on widely recognized rules. Ownership was established through an actual relationship to the goods as witnessed by other people, through possession, through use, through display. So wearing items actually established ownership, but so did securing them in trunks, although then the goods still had to be seen by others. Sarah Allingham lost her sheet because Rosanna Marara had exactly the kind of evidence that proved possession and took the place of the information on a receipt. She had witnesses who could describe the property and value it, connect it to her, the purported owner, provide the date of purchase, and verify the transaction. There were rules for exchange as well. People pawned cloth if they wanted it back, they loaned it if they did not. In pawning, people used clothing as collateral against which they borrowed, paying fees, interest, each week. People charged with theft would often point out that they had actually pawned the goods, which meant that they could get them back, and which meant that they didn't actually steal them. Loans, however, were different. With loans, the owner expected return of the textile's value plus interest, not the goods themselves, which declined in value with use over time. You don't want a used handkerchief back. Value of the item, the interest or fee, and the length of the loan were agreed to at the time of the loan, usually verbally. That was what Sarah Allingham's case was actually all about. The testimony suggests that she had loaned the sheet to her neighbor, Sally Riley, not because Riley was in desperate need of bed linens, but because both women were leveraging the sheet's value. Riley then sold it to Rosanna Marara, which was an accepted practice and did not negate her obligation to repay the value of the sheet. It was only after Allingham believed that Riley had reneged on the loan that she took matters into her own hands and seized the sheet, hoping to recoup at least some of her loss. And then she went to court because it was not just about the sheet. The rules of exchange also mattered enormously. Expectations of enforcement ran deep and kept local courts in both rural and urban areas busy. It is remarkable that people without property rights felt confident in pursuing cases that looked an awful lot like assertions of property rights. Even more remarkable is the response of local officials who dutifully sorted through evidence involving sheets, shifts, shirts, handkerchiefs, and shoes to figure out whose property was whose. The legal qualities of textiles, however, only went so far. 
People without property rights could not make claims through civil actions, the usual means of reclaiming property, because such suits required the possession of rights. Even people with rights, but on the legal margins because of race and class, found civil actions difficult because they did not have the resources to pursue them. So officials shifted these claims to public law, an area of law where they could be tried as criminal offenses, usually as theft. The point in this area of law was to right wrongs, to put things back where they belonged, and that included sheets. So in this area of law, court officials could act on complaints by people without rights by treating their complaints as matters involving the public order. Matters involving claims to textiles fit particularly well within this area of law because the legal principles that allowed everyone to own and trade these goods were so well established, so much a part of the public order already. Prosecution affirmed those practices and restored the property to the place where it belonged without recognizing the rights of the particular people involved. But there were costs. The legal charge theft was a convenience, but it made varied property claims of people without strong claims to rights seem different and illegitimate from other kinds of property claims. It criminalized them. The implications, while ominous in the decades following the revolution, would become inescapable later in the 19th century as the balance of legal authority shifted towards those areas of law that focused on the rights of individuals and away from those areas of law that could accommodate textiles. So rights had definite advantages over textiles though, where claims to textiles stayed in particular contexts, rights-based claims to property traveled freely. If individuals had rights, they could claim property across all the mess of jurisdictional lines within the United States, within states, from state to state, from states to territories, and pretty much in all bodies of law. Portability mattered a lot in a world where people moved and goods flowed freely. In fact, rights, particularly property rights, were a rare constant across all the jurisdictional lines of local, state, and federal courts. The situation was challenging for merchants and businesses who were working across state lines or even just working within many localities because the rules were always different. But the problems were even more fundamental. Those laws also determined a person's status and how they could move through the world. People of African descent, notably, were presumed to be enslaved in some places, some states, and free in other places, other states. No wonder then that the elimination of restrictions on rights, particularly the property rights of women and African Americans, became key political issues in the decades leading up to the Civil War. The problem though was that the extension of rights did not allow for the kinds of claims made with textiles nor did they eliminate other legal restrictions that kept all women, African-Americans, and even poor white men from claiming rights in practice. Textiles had given them legal cover, and without them, they were vulnerable. To be sure, the extension of rights helped. In fact, it was impossible to navigate either the legal order or the economy without them. But the possession of rights only went so far as long as other restrictions remained in place. By the late 19th century, many Americans still had little more than the clothes in their backs, which had become pretty flimsy legal coverings by then. Still, this is a story of hope as well. People on the legal margins did not just wait around for rights to be extended to them. They used legal materials that they had at hand to work toward a world where they could claim their labor, possess their property, and define their own destinies. Those legal materials in the early 19th century were literally the clothes on their backs.